introductions because the council has gone through uh, a couple of different membership changes. Uh, so we want to make sure that some of the new members have a chance to share their background and experience uh, and their eagerness, I hope, uh, to be part of the PCA Workforce Council. And um, we also have some changes cycling off uh, the PCA Council in different capacities, which we'll address. Uh, first, I want to welcome our new members. I'll briefly give of the round, and if they're in attendance and wish to say a few words of personal introduction, I'll recognize them to do so. Um, one of our first new members is Michelle Johnson. She's a consumer employer and advocate. She's been appointed by Senate Majority Leader Bob Duff um, to represent the interests of consumers with developmental disability. Uh, she has served on several boards advocating for the rights of people with disabilities from 2011 through 2016. She was a board member of the Connecticut Council on Developmental Disabilities and in 20. 14, she graduated from Partners in Policymaking. Presently, she serves on several other boards that I think will be helpful at connecting the dots between the PCA Workforce Council and across the long-term care continuum. Uh, those include Connecticut's Cross-Disability Lifespan Alliance, the State Independent Living Council, and now uh, the PCA Workforce Council Think Tank, which I think is particularly synergistic with the work that we do here. Uh, I'll pause and allow Michelle if you want to say a word of welcome. Melissa, I'm is she? Sure. I don't know I'm if the two sure. number is her. No, it's not. And I'm not sure if she is on yet. If she joins, okay. I will let you know. Okay. Next, we'll go to Helen Taylor, who I do see there. So, <laughs> Helen has been appointed by Speaker Matt Redder uh, to represent the interests of consumers with developmental disability. Um, she was recommended to the council by our outgoing uh, member, Peg Szymanski, uh, who was terrific. And uh, certainly, we hold in high regard anyone who she's put forward as a potential uh, successor. Um, and we're glad that the speaker, in after consideration of her background and the requirements for the statutory role uh, has elected to send us the appointment letter for Helen Taylor. Helen, in her personal experience, is the parent of a son who is currently self-directing his supports uh, and is also an influential advocate in on the autism spectrum disorder community. Uh, another very important function that uh, OPM has taken new responsibilities over. So, Helen, I hope that in addition to this work, we can sort of have a follow-up conversation and I can introduce you to Tara Vian Vines, who uh, does autism policy and planning coordination across state agencies. Helen, do you want to say uh, a word of welcome? Well, thank you. I, I appreciate this honor. I'm looking forward to working with everyone to make a difference. Um, that's always been my passion, which is why I even started a non I also work for a time. I also started a nonprofit organization called a social chase um, for adults on this, you know, who are neurodivergent to give them opportunities and activities. And and I also volunteer for Special Olympics. But I've been advocating, I've been to DC, been to the legislation building. In between my working full time and being married with two children, <laughs> with two adult children. But as you said, my son Chase is on the autism spectrum and he's our inspiration for me for me to be here. So thank you everyone and looking forward Excellent. to being part of Welcome. the team. <laughs> Welcome. I've always believed that busy people are productive people, and I'm encouraged, Helen, by how busy you are. I'm sure this council and the work here will give you even more stuff to fill your already filled days. Um Next, we have from uh, the Department of Developmental Services, uh, Nick Gerard. He's the Chief Financial, Financial Officer at DDS, uh, has been appointed by Commissioner Jordan Sheff to replace one of our longstanding members, uh, may have been one of the original members that really helped us stand up Community First Choice and some of the self-directed programs uh, that have been critical to the Council's work. Denise Palladino. Uh, Denise has transitioned to other responsibilities in the agency, uh, but we certainly will miss her and are so happy that uh, Commissioner Chef has given us someone that could really bring some of the financial and operational expertise to our council. Uh, Nick has uh, several years of experience, uh, both professional and personal, with the IDD community 
and a wealth of knowledge regarding waiver services, CMS rules and, and waiver services. So welcome, uh, Nick, do you wanna say a, a moment of a uh, few words? Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I appreciate that sum summary, Claudio, and ultimately um, wanted to thank Denise for all her hard work. I know we mentioned it last time, but she was such a long standing standing member of the council and has given me tons of information that I hope to bring here and you know help however I can. So wanted to express my appreciation for her work, and I'm really excited about this new opportunity. I love it a bridge to the institutional knowledge uh, that Denise had and a, a fresh uh, perspective that you'll add. So terrific. Uh, next, uh, my colleague and good friend from DSS, Christine Weston. Uh, Christine has just accepted a very significant new role as the director of the Community Options Unit. A lot of people uh, who work in the long-term care space, you know, have known Christine for a very long time. She was one of the original founding uh, members of a kitchen cabinet that Don Lambert put together on all things money follows the person and how we started to explore creating state plan services for self-directed PCAs under the community first choice option. So sort of been there from the ground up and heart has been in this. Uh, I know we together have weathered some difficult budget years where we wanted to make sure that the legislature was always aware of the cost effectiveness and the impact that our long term care programs, in particular our home care programs played for the residents of Connecticut and family caregivers across the state. And she's been a, a true partner and champion of this work. So she has been appointed by Commissioner Andrea Barton Reeves and to serve as the permanent replacement. Uh, you all will recall that Bill Halsey was kind enough to temporarily step in. Uh, Bill has also taken on an enormous uh, duty as acting state Medicaid director uh, now that Guy Wollston has left. So um, Christine will be filling in permanently. Uh, she'll also be taking over as chairman of this PCA Workforce Council. So today will also be my last day as chair of the PCA Workforce Council. Um, it's you know uh, one of those things where you reflect back on having had an opportunity to really shape some public policy and an issue that you're passionate about, uh, but also knowing that it's in such good hands with Christine assuming the mantle after today's meeting. Uh, I think she's going to add uh, the nuts and bolts of how to make the program effective for both consumer employers and for the PCAs that are so critical to build out the workforce. Um, so I give uh, Christine my uh, energy. Uh, I'm rooting for you, and we'll certainly still, as OPM, be involved, especially through Melissa Morton. So uh, with that announcement of, of my uh, transitioning off as chair of this council, I also want to acknowledge a couple other PCA council members that are in transition. So uh, Eileen Healy, who we all know and love, uh, this will be her last meeting. Uh, her time on the council saw us through two negotiations for labor contracts, uh, one of which was sort of coming off the tail of COVID, which was so disruptive to our long term care system and really forced a lot of states to look at vulnerabilities and how we deliver long term services and supports. Uh, how do we make it safer? How do we honor consumer choice? And so that contract took on a new dimension where we were for the first time able to provide some basic uh, assurances for connecting PCAs to health stipends and uh, connect them to covered Connecticut, which is a zero cost, zero pre premium, uh, fully subsidized uh, insurance product on the health insurance exchange. Uh, we're also uh, on, on a pathway through that contract and then the successor contract to recognize paid time off, uh, which is another valuable uh, benefit for recruiting and retaining a very robust and well-trained PCA workforce. Uh, Eileen's calm demeanor and thoughtful insights has always been an inspiration to me and one that kept us level-headed during even the most intense of uh, labor negotiations and contracts. I Eileen, do you want to say a few words? I, I would, and I appreciate all of those kind words, and I give them back um, to you and to Melissa in particular, um, who's always been available to answer questions and um, been enormously helpful and supportive as I entered this role. Um, just so folks know, I'm gearing up to retire. 
Um, so I am looking at not immediately, <laughs> but I, I want to get my organization into a solid place before I depart. Um, so that's what I've been doing. And I've learned an enormous amount from this role. Um, the more you invest in it, the more you'll learn and it, it becomes really interesting, if not frustrating at times. So, but thank you all. Excellent. Um, so that concludes just the opening of today's meeting, which was a little bit longer, but I think given the transitions that have happened and some of the people who have spent a lot of time in this council, it was appropriate. Uh, with that, I wanna make an amendment to the agenda uh, for today's meeting. I will entertain a motion that uh, we move the subcommittee reports uh, to be immediately preceding other business and public comments. So I wanna get through a few of the other points move down the subcommittee reports so that they will be fifth on the agenda immediately before item six would then be other business and item seven public comments before we adjourn. Do I have such motion? So moved. Thank you. Motion is moved. Do I have a second? Uh, Nick Gerard second. second. Thank you. Motion is properly moved and seconded. Any debate discussion? If not, I'll ask for a voice vote to uh, confirm the amendment to uh, change the agenda so that the subcommittee reports will move down to the agenda immediately preceding other business and public comment. All those in favor, please signal by saying aye. 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 Yeah. Any opposed? Abstention? So ordered. Uh, the next item for the agenda today is approval of our last meeting minutes from April 23rd. Hopefully everyone has had a chance to review those meeting minutes and uh, I will now entertain a motion that we approve such minutes as presented to the PCA Workforce Council. This is Kathy, I move approval. Thank you, motion is for approval of the meeting minutes. Do I have a second? I'll second, Nicholas Gerard. Thank you, Nick. Uh, motion is moved and seconded. Any edits, discussions, or feedback on the meeting minutes? Seeing none, the question is on approval of the minutes. All those in favor, please signal by saying aye. 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 Any abstentions? Any opposed? Meeting minutes are adopted. The third item on our agenda is the PCA Workforce Council transition. Uh, I already previewed this in our uh, welcomes and introductions, uh, but just for purposes of trying to add a little bit more clarity to it, and I may ask Melissa to uh, talk through some of the logistical details that are going to happen. But uh, since 2014, OPM has uh, stepped in to really provide um, a voice for <coughs> trying to get the collective bargaining of the PCAs uh, in good order, uh, establishing some policy initiatives around the collective bargaining, making sure that they were resourced appropriately and that we were in good coordination between our budget shop uh, and, and our Medicaid agency at DSS to ensure that we would put forward plans that uh, encourage workforce participation and honored self-direction. Uh, the chairmanship of the PCA Workforce Council has resided in the Health and Human Services Policy and Planning Division uh, for a number of years dating back to when David Gutchin was director of this division. Um, and upon his retirement, I assumed the chair and we've taken it through uh, two successive uh, PCA uh, collective bargaining agreement extensions. However, uh, the role statutorily was always established at DSS and the administrative duties and uh, operations of the PCA Workforce Council are in statute uh, APO'd to DSS. And we thought that given this point where now Christine is in place as the director and can set up the vision for how we wanna support community options across our Medicaid and state funded programs, uh, and knowing that we now have a new FI in place, a new long-term collective bargaining agreement, uh, that this was a good time uh, of maturity for the council and for the work that we've done over the past several years to make the transition. 
I think effectively what this will do is sort of eliminate some of the telephone tag and pass through conversations that have to happen by adding uh, another agency. So the operational decisions uh, that reside with DSS as the Medicaid agency uh, and who holds the contract with the FI will more simply be able to respond to grievances, the informal process, which currently exists at DSS and DDS, and also the step one formal grievances when they're filed. OPM will continue to provide uh, lead negotiating functions through our Office of Labor Relations whenever the new contract comes up. So we will have an assigned uh, OLR attorney as lead contract negotiators. Um, the OPM team will also work closely with DSS and DDS on policy and budgetary considerations for vetting any proposals that are exchanged at the collective bargaining table. Um, but the day-to-day -day work uh, of grievances will now be uh, entirely brought under the umbrella of DSS and Christine Weston's leadership. That includes hearings, grievance hearings, uh, writing formal responses, uh, and helping to troubleshoot things like non-payment or if there's an issue that's grieved related to the collective bargaining provisions. I'll pause there and ask if Melissa wants to add anything about some of the mechanics of the transition. I know you and Elise and Maria have made available training and support to ensure things happen smoothly. Maybe you want to illuminate on that. Sure. So um, I think it's important for everyone to know, one, that as Claudia said, OPM is a statutorily uh, mandated member of the council. So even though Claudio will not be serving as chair and OPM won't be responsible for the day-to-day -day administration of the council anymore, there will be a staff member from OPM um, sitting on the council. So OPM will always have a presence um, on the workforce council. So that knowledge isn't just like evaporating. And two, um, as Claudio alluded to, most of the day-to-day -day administration of the council revolves around responding to the grievance process. That's really where the rubber meets the road with the implementation of the labor contract. And that is something that DS, our office is wholly reliant on DSS and DDS to work with the FI and provide us all the information so that we can do the written response. So um, it's pulling OPM out as the middleman and allowing um, DSS, who's already doing the research, has the contract with the FI to um, not have to constantly answer to us pestering them for updates and details, and but getting to just work directly and issue the um, grievance responses directly. There will be very little outward change in terms of what that grievance process looks like, because except that Christine will now be signing uh, grievance responses instead of Claudio. But as I said, DSS always did the informal grievance resolution process. They always sat in on uh, grievance meetings that were held between the council and the union, and they are the ones who ultimately provided all of the um, information, and we just regurgitated it into a letter. So um, it's pulling us out of that transcription process. So some of this we're calling it a transition. A lot of it is not so much a transition as just making the formal switch over, but we will also still be lending ourselves to, uh, that is a change to have to write grievance responses and do daily correspondence. So we're not just like tossing it and saying, good luck DSS. There will be a, a period of behind the scenes transition where we'll be working with DSS and DDS who has to answer for their agency, um, you know, working on historical responses and how to handle. So we will still be lending technical support in the background for a while. Also, um, I think what all of you have seen is there was already a transition where DSS took over um, chairing the training fund subcommittee they have the contract with 1199 training and upgrading fund. Um, so no transition there because they're already the co-chair. They already oversee the contract. They already lead the meetings and handle all the training and upgrading fund parts. Uh, 
the one other change that will be outwardly visible is that because Christine is now chair of the PCA Workforce Council, that means she will also be co-chair of the Labor Management Committee. Uh, so that is another change. But again, it's a change in chairmanship, not a change in what the committee does or how it will otherwise operate. Um, the Labor Management Committee and the grievance process will all still operate according to the collective bargaining agreement. That's where that's our our guidebook. So it will all we will still continue to meet all the terms of the contract and OPM will be um, on hand during a, a period of transition to um, assist DSS and then with any questions that they may have to make sure that it's seamless and that things run smoothly. Okay. Thank you. So with that, uh, we have an update on the collective bargaining implementation and GTI transition. This is the next item for agenda and I will tip to both Nick and Christine. Nick, if you want to start, and then Christine, you could uh, that cleanup hitter. <laughs> sure, that'd be great. Um, so just a couple general notes on FI transition. Obviously, we are now through our first 90 days, and so there are certain elements of the contract that both DSS and DDS are looking into. Um, to give you people just a general description of it, um, the first 90 days are always a transition for this specific FI that we chose, GTI. There is certain um, things that they push their attention to during those 90 days. And then as we move past those 90 days, the goal is to shift um, to more ongoing maintenance and work. Um, I think we all can acknowledge that we aren't yet in that place where we're just into ongoing maintenance and work. There's still a lot of work to be done as part of this transition. Um, but I feel as though, especially from the DDS perspective, and I'll let Christina obviously comment from the DSS perspective, we have made a lot of progress over the last month, and we have been working with our partners at GTI to find ways to better the system, especially with um, the various um, inquiries and complaints and escalations that we've been dealing with. So we want to acknowledge that there is still a lot of work to be done. We have heard some frustration from our constituents and we want to make sure that we are addressing those and we do hear you on those things. Um, Christine, I don't know if you want to make any comments and then I can elaborate more if needed. Yeah, so um, hi, this is Christine Weston. Nice to see you all. Um, yeah, as Nick said, um, we are coming out of our transition period and I um, we have a requested um, meeting with GTI on what that means, right? So like, are we out of transition, what does that look like? Where are we still hitting some roadblocks? Um, and when are, and how are we gonna start kind of mitigating some of like our known issues to really be successful moving forward? And unfortunately, you know, with any time you transition almost with a light switch from one vendor to another, there's gonna be issues, there's gonna be concerns, but we've really been trying to stay on top of them. We've made paying the PCA as our top priority, um, which has caused some, um, downstream impacts administratively, but we wanted to be very certain that nothing was at, no adverse experiences were in largely put onto the PCAs and the employers of record, right? And the members, because we really wanted to make sure that that was, that their care and that there wasn't at risk of any issues with their staff. Now we've had some issues, um, but by far and large, it was very successful payroll. We are making payroll um, each week and we are trying to mitigate each case as it comes up to us. Um, nothing's perfect, of course. We've certainly had our problems, and but I think most of the stuff we've kind of shifted to being a state administrative problem and not so, and trying to not have the experience on the members as much as possible. Um, so we're hoping to have that transition meeting, really establishing the new parameters, getting um, all of the reports that are starting to be due. Like we have to start really holding the contractor accountable and holding ourselves accountable to the contract and and how we kind of see the next few months of the relationship. So I'm excited to start that phase. Um, I really think it's been great how much we've heard directly from the public. Um, no one has been shy about their complaints um, and we've actually welcomed that because that's the only way we know, right? So the calls that we're getting from the access agencies is that the calls we're getting directly into DSS, the calls that are coming in as complaints through the commissioner's office, it all really helps us kind of put into buckets the the themes of the issues so that we can start um, putting resources on them. So we appreciate 
that um, never be hesitant to, to raise a concern or think maybe someone else did it so I won't do it. Please just raise it so we can know if it's a, if it's a chronic theme or a one-off issue. Um, so we've been really partnering really well with DDS. Um, we kind of are all on the same front there with things, which is great because this was a, a try. Um, there's three agencies involved. Um, ADS is also involved. Um, and it, it's I think it's going well, as well as could be expected. Any questions for DSS? This is Kathy. I guess I just wonder, like, what are are there major themes in terms of the challenges that we're still facing? Like, obviously, there are going to be those one off um, problems that people have, but are there are there common issues? And is there anything that the Workforce Council can do to help resolve any of them? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's some things that are certainly in the house of the the, the departments that we can't we can only help ourselves with right some of it is that we're using some antiquated case management systems we're having a heart like we did um you know i keep describing it as using kind of mom and pop shops and going into like a corporate infrastructure that really doesn't have like um the systems don't they're, they're talking two different languages sometimes right so some of that has been a hurdle which is we're trying to mitigate which the, the council can't certainly help um, things that I think the council and where I've heard directly from the public that are helping, which is I think Kathy was someone that told me you have to stay on hold to notify that you're starting a new hire. Like there's no way to and you need to wait two hours potentially to say, hey, I want to start this person or where's my check on this person. And there, there's not a really the portal like the EOR portal isn't really as dynamic or as helpful as it could be. Right. And some people are reporting that they're not seeing their utilization correctly. And we just had a call with GTI and we yesterday and I said, Holly, is there any way we could have the hours, not just the dollars like, of utilization on the portal? And she's like, oh, yeah, we could mm -hmm. convert that into hours. That's not a problem. And that came directly from um, one of our other councils where they're like, I don't know what eight thousand dollars equals in hours right i would like to know my hours and that was something we hadn't hadn't thought of so those are the things that would be really helpful from the council like if you're if there are just like things that could make your experiences better as an employer um you know or your pca's experience better we'd like to hear that because there are probably things that either can be turned on or just aren't being clearly identified so that's where I would say I would like some assistance because we really want the member experience to be improved with this transition. We don't want you to we don't want it to just be a replication of the past experiences. We want the experiences improved. Um, I know I am waiting for an update on the Waterbury Hub to go live. I know that will be very helpful. Like so back in the day, like everyone knew like you could call Val for this or Marianne or for this. Like everyone there was a there was a name and a face at Allied to a lot of the different nuanced issues and you knew who was going to work on them. We don't have that relationship with GTI yet. We're still waiting for that subject matter expertise to be built up in the capacity of the Connecticut um, office to be built. But we are expecting points of contacts for like, who does a provider call? Who do you call for an onboarding issue? Who do you call for a payroll issue? Like, we are waiting for that. It's taking longer than we expected. And that's going to be part of our conversation with GTI. Like, it's been a train. We're at three months. It, we're at this kind of milestone mark, but we've had to kind of shift because of so many of the administrative problems that weren't foreseen. It's delaying some of like our our quality stand up measures like the Waterbury Hub. Is that it, Kathy, if you guys can just keep raising those up through us, that would be very helpful. Can you so I'm a new member when you're I'm not I live in Waterbury when you're saying Waterbury hub what do you mean by that online all right hub. so part so yeah so GTI is a is a national company they're in 19 right. states so right. right now if you call customer service you could be routed to any of their customer service entities part of our contract is we asked for a Connecticut location that was trained in the nuances and the specificities of the Connecticut program so mm -hmm. that is part of their contract they're still ramping up and training that team. We were hoping that they were going to be fully live by now, and they're not. So you still might be routed to uh, making this up, Nebraska. Not that you, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know if they're in Nebraska, but that's just an example. Like, you might be yeah, routed yeah. to someone who doesn't know all the nuances of the Connecticut program, which makes it problematic for consistent customer service answers, okay. right? Because 
one Medicaid program is not like the other, right? And I think um, uh, I think GT customer service is certainly learning that because it is not a blanket answer. So that's why we specified we wanted a Connecticut trained and a Connecticut located space. That's what we're still building the capacity in. Okay, but is the hub a physical building or is it a just? They'll be in Waterbury. Line? Yeah, they're in Waterbury. I don't have the exact address, but they'll be okay. in. They're in Waterbury. Thank you. Uh, Christine, I just want to, uh, there was a message in chat um, from Michelle Johnson, who just wanted to let us know that she's hearing mostly complaints about GT. Yeah, unfortunately, it's 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 complaints that are probably the loudest. Um, we've heard some good things, too. But yes, you're you're right, Michelle. There are a number of complaints and we are trying to, like, work through all of them um, and as we hear them, we try to kind of figure out again if it's global, if it's one off, if it's an administrative issue, if it's a GT issue, if it's a, you know, we're just trying to, again, f find those buckets and those themes and then push, you know, the answers and the solutions for each of the issues. Yeah, I, I've said this like a broken record, but I, I just think it bears repeating. Uh, one, the task that we gave to the new FI was enormous. I mean, we instituted a relatively aggressive and mature collective bargaining agreement that recognized some new benefits that had never been part of the FI contract. The state has resourced significantly the contracts. There was much more cost to these contracts with the expectation that service level would be a lot higher and more responsive to consumer employers. So I've gone back to, at this point, we had a situation where we had agreed to PTO, for example, and this FI, brand new, made a good faith effort. And for the first time in the history of our Workforce Council and collective bargaining, people are able to take paid time off. That's a game changer. Very few state programs like this have been able to make good on that very important basic benefit for taking sick time or paid time off. And this FI has gotten it up and running. That's a brand new program. Instituting paid stipends for the healthcare and helping to navigate that process is brand new. Service times have gone down. Some of the grievances that we've seen at OPM that escalate to uh, step one and beyond have sort of come down. So for me at this stage, I think we hope to give GT a little bit of time to settle their grounding in Connecticut recognize our program is enormously huge and that uh, if they're responsive and willing to get to a solution, that to me is the mark of success at this stage. If we're still there a year from now and we're not getting to a, a solution that's systemic, yes, that's a different conversation. But for me, new person who comes in and is doing good faith effort to institute very complex collective bargaining and really um, nuanced, uh, labor situation where we're making sure that everyone's prerogatives and rights are asserted and protected. Uh, we want to do that right. And for me, the fact that GT has been responsive, the CEO is in meetings with the agencies, lending her credibility and expertise and a willingness to problem solve. Uh, I think they get high marks. Let's give them some space and time to get settled and then judge uh, their their total body of work. I I have a question um, for Christine. Christine, um, do do I address any kind of concerns regarding GT in terms of its um, role as the fiscal intermediary for MFP in particular? I've reached oh. out to them a number of times and they do not yeah. respond to me. Yeah, Eileen, we need to talk about that. Um, I've been a little remiss in my work as MFP program manager um, since Lauren left, and I do know that um, the contract is very different from how we've ever managed um, the MFP and FI relationship, and it almost doesn't make sense, uh, honestly. So I think, Eileen, I, we need a meeting. Um, I, I, I'm going to write, that's a, that's a pen to paper meeting, Eileen, for you. Um, we need to get the MFP contractors in. So the GT contract has buckets of work. So they're, so GT doesn't just do 
the PCAs, right? They do a provider enrollment function. They do credentialing for uh, the MMIS for Medicaid providers. They And then through the MFP lens, they do reimbursement for a significant amount of services that are independent contractors front money for. So there is a there is a whole other fiscal relationship. GT does a, a, a wide swath of work for the department. The, the PCA payroll is just one piece of it. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's dominating the conversation due to the collective bargaining agreement, the size of the, the workforce and, and the administrative lift. So Eileen, I apologize. I, I do know we need to cover that. Um, I want to get a specific point of contact over there for MFP, which doesn't seem to have one, but I'll take that back and get that on uh, with a, con a contractor's call. That would be great, thank you. Yeah. Can I just pipe into, we are getting some comments in chat that people don't know the acronyms that are being used. They don't know FI, MFP. Oh my that. gosh, so, I'm so sorry. So if so, we could just make <laughs> sure. sure to to define so everything for our new members, that would be really helpful. Um, and also, um, Christine, uh, one, of, one of our council members has asked if there is, it, um, who is a consumer, has asked if there is um, an issue with GT, who, who do they call? Like when GT isn't being responsive or they're having trouble and can't get an issue resolved, what, what do they do? Okay, so GT has a ticketing system for like issues and complaints. So I, I don't know if that link has been shared with you guys. So there's a way to submit an electronic ticket that you then can respond, that they'll respond to. So I, I don't know if that's been shared. I can provide that. Um, we also have department points of contact for escalations, um, which given your role on the PCA Workforce Council, I would I have no problem with you guys directly reaching out to um, my two staff that can track those complaints, if you want to, if you want to handle them yourselves, we can give you the ticketing system for you to to email. If you want to alert the department for the department to help mitigate and in investigate, I can do that as well. So I'll put that into the chat, but it'll just take me a second to pull up the, the GTI ticket um, ticketing system. But I'll put both of those into the chat. So just to add to that question, so if they receive a complaint through their system, who's monitoring that from the state? Is that what you're saying? You so, monitored you monitored that? No, so we so well we're we're making the assumption that they're mitigate that they're taking those complaints and mitigating them. We don't have their portal really? access to their ticketing system. We don't I have their I mean they, they have should to report that though. I mean we can't distrust the gov them the governor their own selves, in my opinion. I mean that should well it's be them alert it would just at. be like you calling customer service and putting in a concern and then calling you back with a resolution. It's a, your way of putting an electronic ticket. If you want to put a complaint or a concern about the contractor, you can notify the department. Okay. So that's two separate things, right? If, you, if you've if you called for the last three weeks for the and you've been on hold for two hours and you never got your re returned call or you had conflicting information and you still have an outstanding question, that would kick to us. If you didn't want to be on hold and you had a question or an inquiry or a concern, you could send it through the ticketing system. So those are like two different pockets, right? right so going going back to my because because I'm an IT background person and I do okay. a lot of reporting because I work for EverSource. We do a lot of reporting stuff. To me, if they're a contractor of the government, they should be, should be providing reports of how many complaints they're receiving. Yeah. At, at minimum, at minimum, how many complaints they're receiving. And at minimum, what they are. And what you do with it is different, but there should be accountability that they know that someone's going to look at those complaints that they're receiving. I That's certainly agree, Helen. And we have um, so we have um, we have agreements in the contract that they have thresholds for reporting on very on specific um, benchmarks and outcomes. We haven't gotten into that. That's part of the transition period. Was like we need to let them stand up the system, and then we'll start talking about what we're tracking and getting those reports. Uh, I don't have them all memorized, but call times, customer service issues and complaints is part of the reporting. We're just, I'm just not sorting through all of those tickets right now. There's just, again, there's a hierarchy of um, concern with the GT contract. And right now it's getting PCAs paid. It's finding large themes of issues that we already are I've identified and trying to work through the administrative side of it. So this is by no means ideal. And like Claudio said, this was a, a, a it, a tremendous lift for this company and we're doing the very best we can, but there are problems and we're not 
um, denying that there's problems. Um, like I feel staff, like they've had though. a lot of self accountability. <laughs> they, they certainly admit when they've made a mistake, the department is admitting when we've made a mistake and we're just trying to work together to get it solved. Ongoing reporting is also something that 1199 keeps asking us for. They want all these ad hoc reports from the contractor, but we have to focus on getting the work done and then we'll do the data analysis when we can kind of get ourselves above the water. But we will be doing it. Sounds that. like you need more staff. Oh, because to yes. wait, to wait, to, I mean, obviously, <laughs> I mean, you, you need more staff because of the fact that waiting that long, just from my own experience, is you're just, you're just creating a bomb. Yeah. You're just We're building up, to... you're just building up. So I know you're doing your best, but it seems like yeah. you need more people to help you out with that. All right. I think that Wait. concludes that agenda item. Can Melissa, I just did you make want one? To? Yeah, I do. I just want to ask for respect in our comments, please. And in any comments made, everyone is doing their best. And I understand people are, are frustrated, um, but no one person is bad. And I just, I, I cannot allow that to happen. People are working incredibly hard. And um, we want to take all the feedback that you have and try and troubleshoot. But uh, I would like us to be able to have a respectful discourse. Sorry, Claudio. Thank you for allowing me to say that. Hi, I have. I'm here for Marianne Langton. Would I be able to? Yes, read Patty. If, what when, she to say? I'm going to uh, regain order here. We have a public comment section that's reserved. We will open it up to members of the public. Uh, that time we have a council member that needs to get through the rest of the agenda. So I'm going to move us bracket this conversation. Thank you for that feedback, Christine and Nick for the updates. Uh, very helpful and good reminder of where we are and how much progress we've made to date and a commitment to do even better. Uh, I'm going to move to the next item on our agenda, which are the subcommittee report outs. Melissa, I think the first one may be yours, the training fund. Uh, yes. So. Um, Actually, the training fund is is really the only committee that has any report out, except that I can tell people that the new um, member orientation has been used. We sent it to Michelle Johnson and to Helen Taylor. So um, that was huge. And as part of the transition to DSS, we shared those materials with DSS staff as well. So very uh, big thanks to the subcommittee that put together the um, PCA Workforce Council new member orientation. Um, the bylaws committee, everything is obviously paused for the moment as some of the it's going to have to be reworked post transition um, and then it can go to a vote and getting back to training fund, the last training fund committee meeting um did have to be canceled and will be rescheduled due to, to um due to a medical issue but um i do want to let people know uh, to give a quick update uh i have received a, a few complaints about um the new hire orientation and those of you who have been on the PCA Workforce Council Committee for any length of time know that this is um, a perennial issue. It had gotten a bit better and now we're starting to get calls again from consumer employers who are saying that as part of the orientation, um, tough is once again, their trainers are telling people what they can and cannot do in terms of um, service provision to their consumer employer. And as we all know, that's a main tenant of um, self-direction is that the consumer employer directs the activities of the worker. Um, we received more than one complaint about that. I immediately contacted um, Steve Bender and Christine Fitzpatrick at Tuff. I copied 1199 and they were, um, they, Christine, I asked that the remediation be that they sent an email to all of their new hire orientation trainers, reminding them that they are not to, in orientation, tell people what they can and cannot do as a course of their job. Um, reminder that consumers are the employer of record and to please share that correspondence with us. 
and um, to allow that um, consumer employers be allowed to attend the next uh, training fund committee meeting to share their experience. I received an immediate response from Christina Fitzpatrick. She reached out to, um, she assured me that the 1199 and the 1199 training fund do not so agree that their trainers should not be telling people what they can and cannot do on the job, that consumer employers are solely responsible for directing, I mean, beyond something illegal, which I told, I shared with them that, of course, we don't expect anybody to do anything illegal. Uh, but beyond that, that the consumer employer directs the the, the work of their staff. And um, they agreed with that. They did send an email, which she did share with me, to the um, to all of their trainers. They brought it up at a staff meeting. And when the next training fund meeting is rescheduled, any um, consumer employer who would like to attend and share their story and their concern can let uh, Christine know. And um, both 1199 and the fund committee have agreed to give those consumer employers time on the agenda to raise their concerns. So I just um, wanted the council to be aware that we did get that concern. It was addressed and I am pleased with how um, the training fund committee responded to it and that 1199 agreed to allowing uh, consumer employers to attend the next training fund committee to uh, share any concerns that they may have should they wish to. So um, that is the update I have on training fund. And Christine, I'm not sure, has a date been set yet for the next fund committee meeting? Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I can certainly find okay. out before you publish the minutes. Okay, that's fantastic. And then just a reminder to everybody that uh, we do circulate the, all of the orientations are virtual. And we do circulate, uh, I think they've gotten away from it for a little bit, but we're getting back to circulating the Zoom login info. Council members are allowed to attend and audit orientations. And we used to do that just because things like this would come up. So we would just audit to hear what's being said, to see how it's going. It's important that the council know how PCAs are being trained. Um, and uh, so we don't talk during that. It's just to sit and, and watch and bring any feedback. And uh, so we'll get back to circulating that again. The only thing we ask is that when you do join to audit a session, um, that you just put WFC before your name in the Zoom chat so that the trainer knows that you're a council member. Um, and they know to let you in because you won't be on the registration list. Uh, so we do have to announce that we're there as a member of the council, but you are allowed to go. And uh, I encourage everyone to, it's something that the council pays for. So it's good to go and, and see um, how they're run, especially if you're on the fund, uh, the training fund subcommittee, I encourage you to attend. That's it. All right. Um, did we do labor management, Melissa? Anything we want to note there? Uh, labor management, no, other than that, um, I think we had, I forget when our, oh, labor management was last week. I'm sorry. It feels like it was five years ago. Um, so labor management, we're working on matters related to the GTI transition, some of the concerns that, um, you know, the union has been hearing, uh, particularly around uh, PTO balances and um, dues collection is a big one. Um, 1199 uh, has been concerned about dues, the transmission of dues reports and dues collection making sure PTOs being um, calculated and administered properly. Some of you may know there's some confusion because DDS has 
historically always had its own PTO. And then under the collective bargaining agreement, we now negotiated PTO, a PTO benefit under the CBA. So in addition to having to implement a new PTO benefit for three quarters of the workforce, we're also having to um, try and help people distinguish between their PTO that's subject to the collective bargaining agreement versus their PTO that they're receiving just as a virtue of their uh, DDS consumer employer providing them with PTO. So um, that's taken some education and created a little bit of confusion, I think. Um, and then what are some of the other issues? I think that's it. Oh, um, we have heard a bit about uh, how uh, PTO rates of pay. And uh, so we worked that out with the union. I think some of it was people were not quite calculating the PTO rate of pay correctly, but that seems to have been resolved. Um, people didn't realize it's a weighted average of hours worked. So there was some education that had to happen there. Um, so we're, we're, those were the main topics uh, that were raised at labor management. Claudio, I'm not sure if I missed anything. No, I, I think you covered everything and uh, we've sort of gotten into a point of getting some regular updates from Tufts on the reporting out in the account. So pursuant to the collective bargaining agreement, we just wanted to make sure that we had the uh, Labor Management Committee had a good sense of what the spending was and what the utilization was among the different training programs. It's been an area of investment over the past two collective bargaining agreements. We've really resourced uh, both the mandatory trainings and some of the volunteer trainings. And so uh, that'll be moving forward on a quarterly basis. Tufts will be uh, reporting out and doing a budgetary report out on the training fund. That concludes our subcommittee report. The next item is other business. Any items of folks want to flag for consideration and future um, agendas? If you think of any in the interim, I would welcome you to uh, after today send those agenda items to Christine Weston. But Helen has her hand raised, so go ahead. So I'm listening to some of the challenges, which is which happens when you get a new system. But what's more important that I think people would appreciate it is the communication of challenges. There's nothing wrong with saying, FYI, we're working really hard. These are some of the challenges we're having. I think people might be more understanding of what's going on if you communicate what's going on. So that would be a suggestion to me to send out a, a newsletter, a little memo to people who are using the system or whoever you correspond with. Just let them know what's going on. Um, I think that would be beneficial. Helen, yes, I, I think that's a good reminder of like sort of what's good at this point. How do we benchmark good? And I think not expecting perfection, but expecting transparency and an active communication, help fill the void. You know, that alone sometimes takes away some of the stress from people having to deal with an unknown or a vacuum of information. So I think your advice is uh, well taken. Thank you for that. Uh, that opens us up to the last item before our adjournment, which is public comment. Um, I'd ask that uh, we limit public comment to two minutes per speaker. Uh, we have not received any written comments ahead of time, but I do understand there are some members who've joined us today for uh, the public. So uh, with that, I'd ask, um, can Elise help out with making sure that we're fairly uh, allowing people to have their two minutes and moving through so everyone has a chance to make public comments? Can I ask a quick question, Claudio? I'm sorry. Um, yes, I On the agenda, it, it says the bylaws and the um, orientation manual, those two committees on the agenda, I, I, I served on both of those and I'm not sure where it got left. I, I understood, oh. Melissa, to sort of say that with the transition that those were wrapped up in the transition and need to be refined. So I don't oh, know if okay. there's more, Melissa, you want to add, but I think that was- no, yeah, I'm sorry, Eileen. I, I had said, maybe you couldn't hear me for a sec. I had said that the, um, I actually thank you for your work, the committee for its work. Oh, I definitely we, missed that. 
Yeah, we <laughs> used the new the new member orientation manual to uh, onboard Helen and Michelle, and we shared it with um, DSS staff as part of the to help with the transition of the council to DSS. So that is fantastic. And then the bylaws we tabled because they now need some updating because of the transition, some of the detail in the bylaws, and actually the the orientation manual is going to need some updating as well now. And then we'll have to re-vote. Uh, bylaws never went to a vote, so we're going to have to vote on the bylaws, and then once they're updated, and then we can update and just vote on the revisions to the um, new member orientation. I, I did hear you say that about the training um, and new orientation, but I thought it was in relation to tough. That's why. Oh, I said that, but that was, a yes, we also talked about new hire orientation. So that's, yeah, I get you. It's Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a good update and Eileen that we should never uh, pause about thanking you a second time. I know you did yeoman's work on the orientation, especially that manual, and it'll be particularly relevant as we, move into the next phase to have that institutional knowledge reconciled in a, in a written form. So great work. Thanks, Melissa, for just clarifying and making sure that we were all uh, aligned and understanding the updates from the subcommittee. So uh, with that, the public committee, M Melissa or Elise, can I ask for one of you to just make sure that we're uh, appropriately keeping record of the time and, and give people like, you know, a little notice, like 10 second notice mm -hmm. so that they can wrap up. Uh, I'll do I will that because recognize... Elise is taking me. Okay. So I'm happy. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I will recognize people as they can raise hand function. If anyone uh, has any difficulty raising hand function, if they go off mute and just give me your name, I'll keep a list. And when I recognize, as soon as I recognize you, I'll add you to my list and we'll go in order of recognition. So I have uh, Marianne Colon, who is uh, first followed by Patty Ellis. Those are the two I have. Anyone else wishing to speak during public comment? This Helen is Taylor. This is Sheila Mulvey. I'm on the phone. Okay, so you will be uh, third. Then I have Mary Ann Colon, followed by Patty Ellis, followed by Helen Taylor, followed by Sheila, fourth Elaine Cole. Thanks, Elaine. Okay, that's it for now. Uh, so first person, uh, Marianne Colon, if you could just uh, lower your hand and then you're recognized for public comment. Uh, lower the hand. Did that work? I don't know if it did. Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. Oh, it looks Hi. like you're muted. My name is Mary. Hello? Hello? Yes, Hi, you've my name been is recognized. Mary Go ahead. My name is Marianne Cologne, and I self-direct, help my brother self-direct his Help my brother self-direct his services. Um, I am here today because of all the issues with GT independence. It's not one or two small things. It's not that they're um, not trying to do what they can do. Their own customer service people have told me that they're angry at GT independence because they feel they took, they bid off more than they can chew. I have staff people that haven't been paid their Memorial Day holiday. I've had staff people that weren't paid for four weeks in a row. I have staff people who can't clock in to the GT Independence app, so everything has to be put in manually. Once they do clock in to the app, I can't see who's at my brother's house in real time. My brother is a two to one 24 seven. That is a lot of people working for my brother, and that's a big thing to handle. And I need to know who is at his house that staff are getting there on time. 
I can't see the GPS location when they do clock in. I don't know if they're clocking in on the highway. I don't know if they're clocking in at McDonald's. I know where my brother is. I don't know where the staff is. So with all this going on, I don't want GT independence to think that they're doing a good job. I'm telling them that everything I had with Sunset Shores, I no longer have with GT independence. I have my brother actually lost tech. He didn't gain tech. So with that, I, I've been asking Jordan Chef. I've been asking Krista. I want to be allowed to go back to Sunset Shores. I need peace of mind. I can't go to work half the time because every Friday now I have anxiety from staff calling me and telling me they're going to call the labor union because they didn't get paid the right pay. They didn't get paid at all. Michelle, it's your two minutes ridiculous. is up. I mean, Marianne, I have Mary your two minutes is up, Marianne. Thank you, uh, right. Patty Thanks. Ellis, you're up next. Please, uh, if you could just lower your hand and then uh, begin speaking. Hello. So I'm here with Marianne Link. She's on mute. You're on mute again. Hi, I'm sorry. So here is a written piece from Marianne Langton, who I'm here with. Good morning. I am disappointed that I could not be at this extremely important discussion about the PCA union. I am at a medical appointment, so I asked Patty Ellis to read the paper that I've written for this meeting. My life turned into a living hell after my former PCA, Justine, took the PCA orientation. She returned to work telling me what her job duties were according to the PCA union and what job tasks she could and could not perform for me. Justine, my PCA, informed me that I am no longer the employer. She refused to follow my written job description that I gave her when she came for her interview with me. Lastly, Justine threatened me daily with reporting me to my caseworker and or DSS because she did not like my behavior. I would like to thank Melissa Morton for being proactive after receiving a few emails from me regarding the PCA orientation. She has sent emails to DSS and the PCA union regarding the PCA orientation. I would like to encourage the council to review the PCA orientation with stakeholders, including employers with disabilities. Thank you. And Marianne was able to make it on for the last few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, and thanks for also writing that down so that if you weren't able to attend in person, that important feedback uh, is made available for the record and for the council's uh, information. And I echo uh, the appreciation of Melissa to help trou troubleshoot on that and hopefully resolve it and get it in a better position for you. So thanks, Marianne. Appreciate it. Next, I have uh, Helen, council member, but speaking uh, in public comment. Go ahead. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, yeah, yeah, I just saw it. Thank you. Uh, my son does is part of the GTI um, services. And one of the things that we were asking about was how do they clock in when we want to have a virtual meeting with the person? Like he wants to do a virtual social discussions with them. Um, so it'd be nice if GTI can allow that he doesn't have to be in person to sign something if it's a virtual um, meeting for social conversations and social guidance. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. I love the new energy. As a new member, you're speaking up and you've been involved in all these agenda items. It's going to be such a good, uh, valuable asset that you're going to bring to Christine and the rest of the council. So keep it up. Thank you. Uh, Sheila on the phone. Yes. Um, hello, this is Sheila Mulvey, and uh, I am a, a past member of the uh, council. Actually, I've served eight years on the council, so from the beginning. 
And um, I was a little disappointed when I hear that the orientation um, is um, still presenting the same type of problems. We've all worked on it very, very hard as a council um, to try to get them to understand um, what we needed from them. And the um, one suggestion that I do have is that for years I have felt that at the beginning we agreed that the, that the um, union could go first on their presentation. It was kind of a toss-up thing in a meeting. And um, I had remembered that we also talked about, and then, you know, we could take turns. Well, of course, that has never happened, and I know that we have tried. Um, but that is something I would really like to see. It needs to happen. My new staff coming on have no idea who their employer is. They think it's the FI, and they think it's the union. They think it's the state of Connecticut. And very lastly, after I well inform them that it is my son and and me as the sponsor. And then we, then we have no problem, but they get very confused. And I would really like if we could do something to change that. And again, it can be taking turns every so many years, but to constantly go through this, this same thing after all these years is it's just not fair to us and it's not fair to the employees. Thank Sheila, you. Sheila, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you for Thank sharing. Thank you. Um, Elaine Culp, good to see you, my friend. Ah. Okay, pushing the wrong button. I I get uh, I get confused. So, all right, I found it. Push the button. Okay, done. Hi. Um, big hugs to a bunch of people. Uh, Eileen, you and I have been at this forever, so you get to retire. I've been militantly unemployed since I was injured over 46, almost 47 years ago. So I'm militantly unemployed, I can't retire. Retire from what? Anyway, I'm still here. And I want to give big hugs to everyone and also wish everyone a happy ADA 34. It is, can you imagine, it is the 34th anniversary of the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I may be the only one on this call who demonstrated and got arrested to get it passed. I'm also a songwriter and I have been offering to get people together and sing. And then once you sing together, your working together is a different vibration. So we don't have to do it right now, but Let's get together and work it out. You never know until you try. Let's get together and work it out. We can help each other get by. I volunteer. I've been volunteering all these years. It's phenomenal to me that so many have not taken me up on it, but I will come. Help me because I've become more fragile. I'm but sorry, Elaine, your two minutes is up. I'm sorry. I know, I know, but <laughs> invite me. I'll come. Okay. We Thanks, hear Elaine. You. I've Thank heard you. of swan songs, but you certainly are sending Eileen and I with uh, one of the most joyous, uh, outgoing, and spiritual uh, wishes. Thank you. I appreciate that. I am just uh, sad that we didn't have this meeting earlier because I've been racking my brain about a summer retreat and an outing and team building activities. I think that next year, Elaine Kolb is going to be starring at uh, an OPM event, maybe. We'll have to explore that, Melissa, further. Um, Kathy Ludlum, I, I know you've added your hand. I'm happy to recognize you. We still have some time in the public comment. Would you like to uh, give any comments today?
You're on mute there. Mouse up ten. Mouse up five. Go to sleep. Thank you for your patience. Um, yes, thank you. It's been uh, great listening to the discussion today. I wanted to support my friend Marianne and other employers who are having trouble because of the orientation, the, the new hire orientation. So I support efforts to monitor that, efforts to improve that. We are the employers and there is confusion sometimes about that. The other thing I wanted to support was Helen's um, urging more communication because I know there's, there's con confusion about, for example, the PTO and how it's calculated and other, so many other issues. Not that the newsletter will fix everything, but it does make you feel better if you feel like you're being heard and something's being done. So I just wanted to put in my support for that. Thank you very much. Wake up, mouse down 10, mouse click. Thank you. All right, seeing no other hands raised or anyone seeking recognition during public comment, I'll formally close the public comment period and move to our last item, which is adjournment. So I have a motion to adjourn this meeting. Nick Gerard, motion to adjourn. Nick, second. Second. Second, Eileen. Eileen. All those in favor, please signal by saying aye. 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 All right. Uh, no opposed or abstentions. Therefore, our meeting is adjourned. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Good Thank luck you. to the new chair and the Workforce Council moving forward. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Thanks, day. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.